Well, hello there. Here we are again for a little bit more of Garth Nick's Drowned Wednesday, book three of the Keys to the Kingdom series. Uh, the, the light is a bit weird for me tonight. Look, I've timed it wrong. I had my tea first before I came to record my story tonight. So now I've lost the best light. I don't know what to do, but it doesn't matter because this is a listening thing, isn't it? There's nothing visual here, I can assure you, apart from a sign behind either side of my head. Um, Yeah, the, so I told you, didn't I, the weather has been really, really warm here. Um, And the same today, apart from I can see it's now turning. So we've got lots and lots of clouds. I think towards the north of England we had thunderstorms last night we didn't get them where I am but I can feel there's something in the air believe you me I am sitting here quite soggy <laughs> because it's so warm but I it feels like we've got a thunderstorm coming earlier on it suddenly went really really windy and the sky turned quite gray and actually a little bit black but then nothing came of it, it just went blue skies again very weird I wonder what the weather is like where Arthur is. That's our link. Here we go. Arthur felt as if Dr. Scamandros was watching his back the whole time it took to stomp across the beach to an open-sided tent where he could see Captain Caterpillar, Concord and Sunscorch sitting at a long white cloth-covered table. Lanterns hung at the tent's corners, their soft yellow glow in stark contrast to the strange scarlet twilight. Uh, pause. I do have a bit of a problem with the names in this one. I didn't when I read it to myself in my head, but now I'm reading it again out loud. Th the names, to me, are quite similar. Caterpillar, Concord, Sunscorch, Scamandros. And um, I do get a little bit muddled up who's talking, so if I make any wrong voices, do excuse me. As he walked across the beach, Arthur was thinking furiously. Was Scamandros threatening to reveal his real identity? It hadn't sounded like a threat, but he couldn't be sure. What did the sorcerer want? Who did he serve? He was trained in the upper house, or so he said. He could easily be a servant of one of the Morrow days who would do anything to stop Arthur from liberating any more of the will. Mind the barrels, said Ichabod, leading Arthur between two pyramids of different sized barrels. There was a huge amount of stuff on the beach, all of it very carefully stacked and ordered. Barrels and boxes and crates and bags, and there in the tent in front of the table was Feverfew's chest. Arthur wondered how they'd taken it away without waking him up. Perhaps it already slid forward in the sand by that point. Bring the passenger fo Bring the passenger forward, Ichabod, ordered Captain Caterpillar. He had a writing book open in front of him, and a pen and inkwell as did Concord. Sunscorch had a huge, thick, leather-bound tome, tome the size of several <laughs> bricks. Sorry, I just needed to open the curtain. It looks more like a court bench than a dinner table, and passenger sounded awfully like prisoner. Stand in front of the captain and bow, whispered Ichabod, nudging Arthur Ford. The boy complied, inclining his head not just to the captain, but also to Concord and Sunscorch Caterpillar. And... Caterpillar and Concord gave the slightest nods back, and Sunscorch winked, which Arthur found encouraging. Now, uh, due to uh, the irregular nature of the last day, we have not been able uh, to keep up to date the log of our good ship Moth, said Caterpillar, leaning forward to fix Arthur with his unsteady stare. Wishing to be uh, beforehand with such records and intending to inscribe you as a passenger has reminded me that we do not uh, know who you are, where you are going, or what fare you should be charged. There is also the matter of this treasure. He leaned back when he'd finished talking and folded his hands together. You want to know who I am? asked Arthur. He wasn't sure whether Caterpillar's speech actually needed to be answered. Indeed, said Concord. This is of the essence. Who are you? Where are you from? Where are you going? And how did you come to be on Feverfew's boy? Why did you remove the telltale red pitch from the marker so that we didn't know whose treasure it was below? Do you claim the treasure yourself? Well, said Arthur slowly, stalling as he tried to think of some answers that wouldn't get him into trouble. Clearly, Scamandros already knew or strongly guessed who he was. 
Would it be any worse if the others knew as well? He needed help to find Leaf for a start. It would be a big gamble. Sunscorch would support him, he thought, because he had the Mariner's Disc. Ichabod seemed to like him. Caterpillar and Concord were kind of stupid, even if they were technically in charge, so perhaps they didn't matter too much. Dr. Scamandros? Arthur wasn't really sure about that denizen, but after he'd recovered from having his fingers burned by the Atlas, he'd been nice enough. The crab armour on Arthur's leg worked really well. Speak up! ordered Concord, his voice suddenly squeaked. Ooh. Speak up! replied Concord, his voice suddenly squeaked, which removed all authority from it. My real name is Arthur Penhaligon, Arthur said slowly. I am a mortal from Earth, but I am also master of the lower house and the far reaches, though I have given up my keys in trust to Dame Primus, who was once part one and two of the will of the architect. Caterpillar's mouth curled up at one end as Arthur spoke. Then he broke out in uproarious laughter, followed a second later by Concord. Sunscorch neither smiled nor laughed, but looked down at the huge book in front of him. <laughs> very good, very good, Caterpillar chortled. Master of the lower house and the far reaches, Arthur Penhaligon. Most amusing. But I am Arthur Penhaligon. Yes, yes, you've had your little joke. Now, answer the questions. Most specifically, do you intend to claim this treasure? I really am Arthur Penhaligon. Why don't you believe me? Don't be silly. Everyone knows Lord Arthur is a mighty fighter. Why, he defeated Mr. Monday in personal combat and wrestled Grim Tuesday to the ground and broke both his hands. Besides, I've seen a picture of Lord, Ar Lord Arthur. Huge, broad-shouldered chap. Carries a bag full of magical apparatus he invented himself. Not to mention, he always travels with his giant half-bear, half-frog assistant, and an assassin girl who used to be the Piper's bodyguard. What? said Arthur. You mean the Will and Susie Blue? It's all here, you know, said Concord, pulling out a tiny book from his sleeve. It expanded into a large hardcover, bound in red, with the title embossed in enormous gilt letters on both the spine and front cover. The Epic Adventures of Lord Arthur, Hero of the House. Look, the front piece is a portrait of Lord Arthur. Concord held the book open to show a colour plate that had been stuck in next to the title page. It showed a very tall, handsome man who looked and dressed rather like Monday's noon. He was posing next to an open carpet bag that was glowing with rainbow-coloured light. A bizarre hunched-over monster that had the legs of a frog and the upper body and front paws of a bear crouched next to him, and in the background an Amazon woman in silver armour was cutting the head off a misshapen semi-human creature that was clearly supposed to be a nithling. So, who are you? said Concord again, snapping the bookshelf. And let's be clear this time, what about the treasure? What about the treasure? asked Arthur as he tried to gather his thoughts. It hadn't even occurred to him that they might doubt his identity, but it was clear that both Concord and Caterpillar's main concern was the treasure. I don't even know what the treasure is. Do I have a claim to it? Caterpillar and Concord looked at Sunscorch. It looks as if that's so, said the second mate, tapping the book in front of him. Dr. Scamandros had a reading of the laws from him. It looks to be that young Arth here is entitled to 90% of the value of this treasure. 90%? exclaimed Caterpillar in Concord. Caterpillar added, Scamandros, how can this be so? Arthur hadn't seen the doctor, but the denizen stepped into the light from beside the table, so he must have followed Arthur and then stood in the shadows. According to the Blue Book of Admiralty, a fixed boy treasure marker is itself considered a vessel. This young mortal here was in command of the vessel by virtue of being on it. Mr. Sunscorch took him off at his request, but Arth did not relinquish command of the boy which marked the treasure and which was not taken in tow. By taking the chest and not the boy as well, the vessel is still considered to be afloat, and the treasure it marked notionally still of it, though no longer marked by it. The matter is further complicated, as the treasure was the property of a pirate outlawed by direct writ of Lady Wednesday, so it is considered immediately forfeit and property of the house authorities, with a reward equal to an amount of 90% of the value of the treasure being paid to the finder. We are not the finder, Arth is the finder as demonstrated by the unfortunate fact that he is marked with the red hand. 
we are in possession of having salvaged the finder and must come to some arrangement with him. But should Arth wish to be returned to the boy with the chest, we have to do so. I'm, I'm not sure I followed any of that, said Arthur. You're saying the treasure has to be given to Wednesday because it belongs to a pirate, and I'm entitled to a reward equal to 90% of its value because I found it first. Yes, said Scamandros. However, we do not have to help you. We can simply return you to the chest or to the treasure marker. There is also the matter of the original owner of the treasure, so there is room to negotiate, I think. Sure, Arthur tried to smile as he spoke. It sounded crazy to him, but no crazier than some of the court reports on a news back home. Murderers who weren't murderers because of weird technicalities, companies that didn't have to pay debts because of odd loopholes. What do you suggest? We should first find out what's in the chest, said Dr. Scamandros. Do we have your permission to open it? Yeah, said Lord Arthur. Uh, said Arthur. He was surprised they hadn't opened it already. He would have been if... He would have been... Oh my goodness. He would have if they'd been asleep all day. I have taken the precaution of examining the chest with various magical instruments, Scamandros continued, and I have neutralised a number of nasty little traps, so it should be quite safe to open. Just flip back those two catches and turn the key. There wasn't a key there before. Yes, I had to fashion one to fit, said Scamandros. Go ahead, open it. Why do you want me to open it? said Arthur. Scamandros knew who he really was, and there was still something slightly shifty about the sorcerer. He wouldn't quite meet Arthur's gaze. What if there's a trap you missed? I am merely following the correct procedure. It is your... Stand back, lad, interrupted Sunscorch, who had left the table. Best to let a denizen bear the brunt of any trickery. You mortals are too fragile. Thanks muttered Arthur. It felt a bit bad now, as if he'd been a coward, but Sunscorch seemed to think it was perfectly sensible of him to refuse. He smiled and nodded at the boy as he walked past and knelt before the chest. Sunscorch lifted the two clasps at the same time. They snapped back with a loud click, immediately followed by a strange popping noise that made Arthur jump, till he realised it was actually the sound of the entire crew of the moth drawing in breaths of anticipation. They were all gathered around in a half-circle up the beach beyond the lantern light. The last of the vermilion twilight had faded, so the denizens were just dark outlines, but Arthur could sense their concentration on sunscorch in the chest. The second mate turned the key. It played musical notes as it turned several times in a lock. Each note seemed like it would be the last. Finally the key stopped, and instead of a jangled note, there was a soft... As the lock released, Sunscorch leaned forward and tried to lift the lid. Oh, came a hundred throats. Is that all? asked Arthur, looking over Sunscorch's shoulder. The contents of the chest looked very disappointing to him. It was full of little off-white blocks carved with letter. They looked like cheap mahjong pieces. Sunscorch didn't answer. He seemed quite stunned. Looking around, Arthur saw that nearly everybody else was as well. They were all staring with their mouths open. Except for Dr. Scamandros. He bent down and picked up one of the small box and blocks and tilted it so the character carved into its surface caught the light. A deep, racking cough, pronounced Scamandros, fixed in Arafun ivory from Senhain. Good for twenty years or more as house time flows. Oh, I forgot his voice there, didn't I? He put it back again and took out another piece. Arrows yell a rush around the neck, head and ears. Fixed in wood-fired clay, good for at least a decade. Arthur knew that human diseases were valued by the denizens of the house. They would get the symptoms but not feel the effects, so these little blocks of ivory and clay were how the diseases were actually used by the denizens and would presumably be in demand, but what were they worth? This is a great treasure! A very great treasure. There must be 20,000 coughs, rashes, swellings and other diseases here. All of the highest virulence and fixed by first class sorcery. I would guess its value to be in excess of a million simoleons of gold. That's simoleons, aren't they, out of Sims 4? I'm sure they are. Anyway. His words were met by a vast cheer from the crew who began to sing and dance around and throw their caps in the air. And 90% of it is mine. He could barely make himself heard above the uproar. Notion, notion, 
notionally replied Scamandros. As I said, if you want both yourself and the treasure to remain salvaged, you must come to an agreement with Captain Caterpillow. Fever few will never bear this loss, muttered Scunman Sunscorch, who was still staring at the open chest. He pointed at a small bronze plaque set on the underside of the chest's lid. As his finger touched it, the letters engraved there burst into red fire and a booming voice roared across the beach. Thieves! 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 This be the treasure of Captain Elishar Feverfew. The red hand marks you. Feverfew's vengeance shall be swift and slow. Swift in the taking, slow in the making. Regret and repentance shall prove no... Whatever else the voice was going to shout stopped as Dr. Scamandros tapped the plaque with an ebony paper knife that materialised in his hand. Silence fell over the beach. The only sound, the lapping of the waves on the shore. The denizen's songs and cheer were gone, replaced by a mood of dread. I'm the only one with a red hand, said Arthur, aren't I? Yes, though fever few would kill or enslave anyone sailing with you or giving you aid. You're a sorcerer, can't you get rid of it? No, it is beyond my power. Fever few is an expert in magics that I do not wish to know. Arthur looked down at the treasure, then at his red hands. So... You're all at risk from fever for you while I'm around. Indeed, though, in truth, fever fuel kills or enslaves everyone encounters anyway, but the red hand marks you for a particularly long and unpleasant ending, and we would probably share in it. Can you send messages to other parts of the house, and can you find out what's happening to someone if they're in the house? I mean, by your sorcery? Yes, on both counts. In that case, said Arthur, turning back to Captain Caterpillar, I'm prepared to offer you and the crew of the Moth all of my share of the reward in return for some help, and I want to get a message to Dame Primus. Captain Caterpillar nodded his agreement. I need to find out what's happened to my friend Leaf, who I think is aboard a ship with glowing green sails. Once again, Caterpillar nodded, this time with a smile. Arthur paused, thinking about what he might need. And I might... I might want passage as quickly as possible to... Wherever I can meet Drowned Wednesday. What? Shrieked Caterpillar. Are you totally mad? All right, mate. Chill out. Chill out. Just believe him that he's actually Lord Arthur. Gosh, I don't know what's happening out here. There's lots of shouting going on out there. This is a peaceful establishment, I'll have you know, people out there. Gosh. I think it's just some old men out there talking about their garden, actually. Very exciting. Anyway. Monday for me tomorrow. Uh, so Mondays, now I'm back to work. If you were here before I had my summer holiday, you know Mondays are notoriously tricky for me because I have a long old meeting after work. I'll try and get here, but it might be a little bit later. Tuesday, easy peasy, fine. Wednesday, I won't be here. Wednesday, I'm out for the evening, so I won't be here on Wednesday, but I should be Mon day question mark tuesday thursday friday saturday sunday all right okay thank you very much for listening i hope you have a lovely sleep and i'll see you all tomorrow at some point <laughs> night <laughs>